Great. Thank, thanks so much. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here and, of course, a privilege to uh, be asked to give the keynote presentation. I realized I haven't been to SBIE San Diego in a while because I looked for the posters. Didn't they used to be way over, over there? Yeah. It's been a few years, so I was looking around. Where, where is everything? And, uh, and so it is, a, it, is, it is fun to be here again. Um, what I thought I would do in the first few slides is show you some things that we were doing about 10 to 15 years ago and contrast them with what can be done today as a vehicle for getting into uh, the heart of my presentation. So this actually is the first co-registered ultrasound image that we published and it showed up in this paper by David Roberts in neurosurgery and we were using at that time an old Aloka machine and I, this was orphaned in the OR. We didn't have an ultrasound machine for our research at that time. This was a, a, a unit that the OR personnel just pushed around and got out of the way and, and we recovered it and started using it and I can remember the staff just sort of rolling their eyes when David wanted them to bring this thing in and we started to use it. In fact, you can see how cruddy the image actually is. And, it, and in that day, we defended like crazy that this is that ventricle. Although kind of looking at it today, you go, hmm. Um, so this is then. And I should say that this image, this, I loaded this PowerPoint from an old deck that Mike Mega made. I added the then in there, and then I added this because it, 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 when Mike made this, um, the paper wasn't yet published. And those of you who work with students, students like Mike only come around once in a while. And I think you, those of you who are in academic programs know the phenotype. So Mike, when he was at Dartmouth, he had such pride in what the group was doing and the work he was doing, he was the go-to PowerPoint guy. Uh, he made the great, best PowerPoints, even at research meetings, you know, within the group. It was always great. And every time I'd say, Mike, I've got to have those slides. Mike, I've got to have those slides. He never gave them to me. And it wasn't that he didn't want to give them to me. It's just, well, we never connected. So before he left, and I was going to slash his tires to make sure, I had him create for me six repositories full of all this stuff. And so, Mike, I found this in repository five. Uh, it was amazing that I could find repository five, actually, after, after a dozen years, but did find it. So in the spirit of uh, looking back, these are a series of references. And I've, actually, as I was roaming around in this old... Uh, part of our storage space. These are references that we had in our first competing renewal grant that supported this work. Of course, you'll recognize the uh, seminal work of Terry Peters and his students, uh, Buholtz and colleagues at, University, at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, I think this is a Vanderbilt reference, if I remember. I remember this Urbay reference. When we were writing this grant, we came across this thing. And if you read the abstract, it sounded like they already did our grant. We were going, oh my gosh. And then when we looked at the paper, um, there was plenty of room to, um, to move forward. When Marvin called me uh, and asked me to uh, give this presentation, he was telling me about this joint session and he told me, you know, last year Terry Peters um, gave this fantastic talk about, you know, it was in a cardiology setting, and I said, Marv, I know Terry Peters. I've seen Terry Peters speak. I'm no Terry Peters. <laughs> and he said, no, no, no worries, no worries. Um, it'll be okay. You'll do fine, and we'll, we'll see. So if you get a survey about rating speakers in here, what I want you to do, forget the uh, answers that are there. Just put some number times TP. So and if I get a 60, 60% 60 of TP, I'll feel like I really did a great job. So here's what we can do today, and I'm going to show you a lot more of this. So this is a, this is a co-registered ultrasound exam. Look at the details now in here, the faults, et cetera, a full volume acquisition over the area of interest. Back then, when we first started, we were using an electromagnetic tracker. And here's the thing that sit under the, uh, you know, the head clamp. And this, I know there's still work in, in electromagnetic trackers. The great thing, non-light of sight, et cetera. But we could never get this thing to work consistently because of the electromagnetic and magnetic environment, metal environment in the OR. Sometimes it worked great, and we thought, oh, we got it. Then we'd do a case, and it was completely off. Uh, it was nice and, and uh, back. This is another, uh, I think this is repository one, Mike. So, so then we went to um, something like this. And look at this giant. Uh, those of you who have worked in this area, you know, engineering students have built devices that you could attach to the probe. 
Because if you took it off, you didn't want to have to recalibrate. You wanted to be able to attach it again. So this big, heavy metal thing, here's a little button we made for Dave so he could push the acquisition that he wanted. And we went to the optical tracker. So what do we have today? We still have the optical tracker, of course, but now we're using sort of these uh, thermal plastics. We just form it onto the uh, transducer head. It fits very tightly. The thing's not moving at all. And now we have better scanners, et cetera. So that's been hugely, uh, a huge improvement uh, uh, in a lot of ways. How about cal uh, uh, calibration? Those that have worked in the field also have had many graduate students working hard in the lab to try to get the relationship between the ultrasound pixel or voxel and the world coordinate system followed by the tracker. And uh, this uh, is work out of, uh, uh, again, Terry Peters' lab. I think Cuomo did this, if I recall, where they invented this idea of putting these little ends in tanks and the little wires so you could see, you could write lines, equations for those lines and really do a nice job. And that was a big advance. Um, we would spend hours making these tanks, scanning them on CT scanners with little fiducials, and the techs hated us. We'd have to scan at night because they were sure we were going to burn out the tube of the CT scanner because we got these super fine uh, scans to try to define what is the geometry here. So I might remark, this is definitely not from the MEGA repository. In fact, this background's kind of hideous, in my opinion. This I got from Alex Hartov. Uh, and not to throw Alex's uh, PowerPoint skills under the bus, but, uh, you know, we'd never do this. And... Um, the other interesting thing, I, I thought about this experiment today. If uh, those of you who know Alex will really appreciate this, that um, a Dartmouth undergrad should do a sociology experiment and track Alex's ba backgrounds over time and then try to correlate that with some kind of social trends or whatever. And it'd be an, in those of you who know, it'd be an inverse correlation. <laughs> Alex was not one to follow the norms of the day, so he, he, he did this. But Alex is a fantastic has a fantastic mind, and so if he can do this, he can use any PowerPoint slide he wants. So what Alex did, what we do now, and he published this in 2010, this was he feeding off this work by Rousseau, he now a coordinate-free calibration that can be done for 2 and 3D at all spatial, at all, uh, you know, scan depths. So this is a huge advance. In fact, 10 years ago, one of the fears of the graduate students in our research meetings was Dave Roberts would come in and say, you know, I think that scan head thing is a little loose. We need to recalibrate, you know, because this was a big deal. And if you were in the lower pecking order of the graduate students, that was your job, and you had to spend the next, you know, hours, really, because you had to collect it multiple times to get the thing ready for the next OR case. Now what happens? So our graduate students don't appreciate it. Yeah, you go find a Tupperware thing. Anything that holds water, fill it up, get your metal plate, put it in some oblique angle, and scan it and make these fits to the plane or a uh, line for 2D, and it works great. You know, the one good thing about the, uh, uh, that, that uh, fear of having David come in about in calibrating was that made all the grad students come, because if you weren't on the lower end of the grad student and you weren't at the meeting and Dave said, we need to recalibrate, it was your job. So despite those technical challenges and the effort that went into it, this is circa now 2003. Again, I copied this from a slide that Alex had. And this was playing actually in the front panel. You could do pretty well. So this is uh, co-registered ultrasound, um, tracking the scan head as it goes along. And I think we all learned, and clinicians knew this, if you look at this ultrasound scan in isolation, you can't interpret it nearly as well as when it's overlaid on the fine structural resolution. In fact, if you were to look at this, you'd probably think, what's this? Is maybe some artifact, or maybe this patient has a metal uh, rod in her head or something? No. No, it's the fox. So, and you can see the details. So, th this became very useful, uh, a very useful visual aid. And in fact, there are many, uh, we, we weren't the first at all to do this, and we, we uh, wrote on the backs of many, uh, many uh, teams that really showed the way to develop what we would call a reconstructed three dimensional volume from a swept set of uh, ultrasound scans, and there are a variety of ways of doing it. So what about this? It was great for visualization. We would feed this back to David pretty much in real time, and he would see it. He loved it. It gave intuitive guidance for the surgeon. But what we were really interested in, and this is really where the, where the problem became here, what we found is over time in about 30% of cases that we didn't really get a very good sampling of the image 
region of the surgical region of interest. And here's an example, an illustration of that. So while David would move it very slowly and we'd collect this data over the over the uh, surface that he was scanning, you get bunches of data in here. You'd miss big areas. Sometimes he'd do a single acquisition, and that was what that button was for. If you push it once, you got a single acquisition. You push it twice, you'd start a sweep. But it didn't really sample the volume all that uh, uniformly or completely. And we were interested from the technical side of using ultrasound not as an end game. It was a nice tool. Again, it gave that intuitive feel, those images that you saw. But we, wanted, we saw it as part of an overall guidance process where we wanted to use that data, that information. We wanted to use it quantitatively to, along with other tools like, inter, like stereo vision, into a uh, process where we would take that data and assimilate it into an estimation algorithm that would try to project the full deformation field back onto the original MR. So you'd have these original MRs, you'd use these data feeds and some modeling strategies, and the goal was then to produce what we called this model updated image. So we really wanted to use this information quantitatively, and we found that in any number of cases, and again, sort of roughly 30%, we really didn't have the information in this swept scan ultrasound uh, data set to do what we really wanted to do. And in particular, we wanted to do image-based registration, and we wanted to do displacement mapping, again, to feed into this overall process, not, as a, not ultrasound as an end game uh, for guidance by itself. So in summary, while the 2D swept scan was, uh, was very useful, it had some problems in the setting that we wanted to use ultrasound for guidance. You know, the images were planar, you got a lot of scans, you, it was sort of inefficient. You didn't really sample the space nearly as well. And, it, and this would be circa 2006 or 7. You know, 3D ultrasound was starting to become available. And in fact, uh, Song Bai Jai reported at this meeting in 2008 uh, our initial work with the uh, uh, Philips IU22 scan head with uh, transducers at 3 and 7 megahertz. We got this one a little bit later. We started out with this unit. And, you know, the advantages, and I'll illustrate those as we go forward, were a volume acquisition without moving the scan head, so you sampled the space. It was efficient, and again, um, you could get the whole region of interest not, not relying on the surgeon's movement of the scan head and the acquisition there. So what I'd like to do in the next few minutes, first we had to understand what the coordinate system is. What is that native data? And then I'll start to illustrate how we've been using that at Dartmouth to uh, uh, improve navigation, or what we hope is improving navigation. So the, the Philips scanner has a, sort of this coordinate system. It's a cylindrical type coordinate system. It's got R, sort of the traditional, I mean, a spherical, traditional spherical coordinate R. But then the angles are a little bit different. It produces this uh, sort of frustrum type acquisition. Let me just show these. I think these will run here. So there's R moving. Again, so the scan head is up here. There's that point. So this is the plane um, orthogonal to the axial direction. Whoops. Let me go back. Let's see if I can get this guy going here. So this is the theta, so-called theta angle, and then this is the phi angle sort of sweeping out this set of stuff. So the data comes in this, in this framework. So here it is, just a set of orthogonal planes with our scan in here. And that's great, except for what we wanted to use it for. There were definitely some limitations and things to work on. So the raw data was in the so-called frustum uh, space. Um, the voxel size is not uniform. You know, it depends on, certainly on distance r. Uh, and it's not in a regular grid pattern. So this prevented you from using all the things that are in tools like ITK that are looking for a Cartesian coordinate frame. Um, so w you'd like to put in that framework. And so what we did, and this was an observation that Song Bai Jai uh, came up with, was we resampled this or rasterized it, as he liked to refer to it. And what, he, what Song Bai recognized, and because he's kind of a finite element jock, that if you, if you look at, if, as long as delta R, the R sampling is not too big, these eight points sort of look like a deformed hexahedral element. And so you can take advantage of the finite element isoparametric mapping that allows you to uh, map the, both the geometry and the field. In this case, the field is the image intensity through these sort of uh, basis function expansions. Very efficient, very fast. And he, he, uh, he observed this and it produced what we call this trilinear algorithm, which was very clever. And, and we uh, then were able to take the original phi image, for example, 
and so-called rasterize it so now it's in the square block uh, outside filling in that space. And now we're able to use the uh, more traditional types of image processing tools that are available. So how well did this work? We did some experiments, or Song Bai did. One of the first things he did was look at some uh, carrots here in a phantom. And notice this is a good engineering experiment. This is not a physics experiment because we don't have duct tape here. So he's got this, uh, this here. So what he did was he's tracking the, the scan head. And then this is connected to a micro manipulator. So he took one acquisition, and then moved this over a very small amount, took another acquisition. And since they're tracked, we have them in the same coordinate system. And then you can interpolate the second image back into the coordinate positions of the first image as the ground truth. And so we were comparing at the time this algorithm, what we called TRI, to other things that were in the literature, voxel, nearest neighbors, probably the most efficient thing, just grab the nearest, uh, you're in a, at a point, grab the nearest voxel to that and assign that image intensity to it. Not particularly accurate, but fast. And then there were other kinds of distance-weighted algorithms that were out there. And so what he did in these experiments were compare these two. So here's that, the, the carrot stuff looking along this line here. This is sort of the difference between the ground truth, and you can see here's the variability of voxels on the nearest neighbor. So these two are much more um, uh, uh, equivalent in terms of the image intensity that's being reproduced or being interpolated relative to that ground truth. And then clinically, uh, since there wasn't a ground truth, we do one of these leave one out games. So you downsample the native data, take every other uh, frustum or uh, every other R and theta and phi angle and then interpolate back to the original space. And so again, looking at those three things. So actually, you can see, actually, all of them are pretty decent, really. You have to kind of look fairly hard. Look down in here, you can see some uh, improvements maybe relative to, to uh, well, voxel nearest neighbor. Quantitatively, if you look at it, here's a table from that paper. Uh, Time-wise, so this is the clinical data. I think these are some other simulations. You see what I said, the, this was not quite as fast as the uh, voxel nearest neighbor, but pretty close and much faster than the other distance-weighted type of algorithm that was, we were comparing to in the literature. And then accuracy-wise, and this is in uh, intensity units, so this is sort of five out of two, or six out of 256, and so sort of one to two percent, and this is maybe six, seven, eight percent. So not a huge difference, but definitely an improvement and, and fast. So this we started to adopt. And the other nice thing about it was this allowed us to now combine multiple acquisitions. While you put the scan head down, David would make an acquisition. If he decided to move it, we could take another acquisition, take a few acquisitions so you could really get a, a, a detailed sampling. You could also average those samples. So by having this ability to project the information into this Cartesian grid allowed to, us to, uh, to do that very efficiently. So we could uh, combine into a single um, rasterized interpolated volume. And uh, Song Bai uh, reported that in a MECA conference a few years ago. So here's how it looks like in 2D. I may have two acquisitions that are in this common coordinate space. Uh, and so I rasterize, interpolate, and I can, we just did some simple averaging. There's probably perhaps more, even more sophisticated ways you could merge that data if you, if you wanted to. Interestingly, uh, what we found was another good discovery is if you actually co-registered that data before you averaged it, you could reduce um, tracking error. So you could actually get a better uh, uh, combined image volume. And this illustrates that here. And, and we did uh, mutual information as the Im image similarity metric in this, in this development. So here's a patient study where we did the mutual information re-registration before the combination of the data sets versus down here. And if you look at this blown up area, you can see this is much more blurry. Again, I think that's partially tracking error that you can help reduce. So that was a nice thing to do, to go ahead and make that uh, re-registration before combining. OK, so that gives us some background and some uh, um, ideas about this data, how we can use it, what, or how we can acquire it, and what, what form it's in. So let's now move into. Uh, some of the in, uh, more interesting work that we were interested in, as well as others. So, for example, registering ultrasound um, image-wise rather than through fiducials. What could we do with that? How could we do it? So forth. So we certainly weren't the first to do this by any means, and there was a lot of literature that we, um, and I'm going to give a few examples here of papers that we were aware of uh, that were important well, well preceding us. So this is, we're now talking circa 2008, 9, 10, that, that sort of time frame. 
So this uh, paper by Roach developing the so-called correlation ratio, I think this is an INRI group uh, with Pennock um, that came out uh, you know, using an image intensity in the MR plus the gradient uh, information to uh, register with ultrasound. They, they remarked, uh, I don't show any table here, that there were worst case registration errors between ultrasound and, uh, so this is intermodality, if you will, between ultrasound and uh, MR uh, using this correlation ratio image uh, similarity metric it was on the order of the MR resolution. And this I just copied from the paper. So here's this pre-op uh, MR and sort of what they described as a manually initiated ultrasound acquisition in terms of where it is spatially, and then the registration down here, and then the overlay. I thought this was a neat overlay, the way they used this um, sort of line representation of the MR uh, with the uh, ultrasound overlay. Um, you can't talk too much about this sort of stuff without referring to the Fencer group. Um, so they were interested in uh, uh, carotid artery uh, registration with the MR obtained with Doppler ultrasound. Um, just copying a couple of tables out of that paper here from 2001. Uh, what they looked at were some of the issues with image intensity between ultrasound and the MRA. And just show here with a pr particular setting, this, this is the five patients that they were looking at. You could find that all five produced uh, quote unquote correct, at least visually accurate uh, registrations. They, you know, one of the tricks in this is the so-called uh, capture range. Once it's registered, what if you're off? You know, you perturb the registered uh, information and can you get back to that registration, often referred to again the capture range. So how far can I perturbate that off? And they looked at two uh, levels of misalignment, what they called limited and full. And if it was this limited misalignment, um, which I just block out here, so you know, not very far actually, five millimeters uh, in X and Y and one in Z in an angle of 40, 99%, only, they only missed one out of 107 um, registrations. So here's a picture from the paper, it's kind of neat. So there's the uh, MRA data and then the, again the co-registered Doppler ultrasound. Another really nifty example, um, this I think is from the Montreal Neurological Institute and there was a collaboration in this paper with uh, Unsgard uh, uh, work in um, Norway. So another segmented vessels uh, with Doppler ultrasound and MR. Um, they looked at both some both linear uh, or, or rigid registration and some nonlinear forms that the, I think was thin plate spline, if I remember. And here's a data table from them, from that paper. And um, just look at this patient three. I'll show that uh, the actual image from that patient. So you can see, so the distance, so what they were interested in was a correction to try to assess what was the deformation that was resulting uh, post-procedure with an interoperative ultrasound. So they described the distance between the vessels. So they were originally co-registered and now something's happened and how far did the vessels move relative to that initial registration. So you can see pretty far, uh, well over a half a, a centimeter up to almost a centimeter. And they, with the, even with the uh, rigid registration, they were able to reduce that very nicely. And actually, they didn't get that much benefit from, the, from this thin plate spine approach. And here's the picture for that patient. So the MRA is the color, ultrasound is the gray. So before the registration, again, they were already, the ultrasound is already co-registered, but something has happened now. It's later in the procedure and they're making another acquisition. So this is off, and then they can recover that pretty nicely. So that was a pretty neat study. Um, and this was, I took this just out of the abstract or somewhere in the paper. Uh, in terms of tracking homologous uh, landmarks, they felt the accuracy was uh, about a one and a quarter millimeters. And then what they did was they excluded some vessels in the uh, re-registration and then tried to assess how accurately those were, how, how well they aligned, and sort of found that to be on the order of millimeters. So pretty, pretty nice work. So we first started this um, ourselves. Uh, with the idea of a re-registration with this 3D scan head. So um, we would do fiducial registration. Prior to dural opening, when there's very little movement in the brain, Roberts would take an ultrasound scan, and then we'd re-register that uh, with mutual information. 
And you can see, so for example, the, the uh, fiducial registration is a little bit off. So there's the Falks. You can see some misalignment here in this error. And then when you do this re-registration, you can realign those. And that makes sense, right? You're sampling, if you will, the entire volume rather than having all your fiducial in indicators on the surface. So you're doing much better. Why not match up the things that you really want to track and follow during the procedure anyway? Even if there is error, you might as well get those aligned from the start. Even if there is a little bit of movement prior to dural opening, why not get that perfectly aligned and go from there? And so this worked very, uh, very effectively. Now, those of you who know David Roberts, uh, he's, he's always challenging us technically. So when, after David said this, he says, ah, I don't want to do fiducial registration anymore. Can't, you, can't we do something? I just want to get my scan head in there, and you just tell me where it is. Surely you can solve this problem, right? So we started to ask the question, would it be possible to do fiducialist registration with ultrasound to MR from the get-go, to register the patient to the, to the MR through the ultrasound information that we got at time of acquisition? And it turns out you can. So here's sort of the picture, and here's the equation down here. Um, this is what you want to get. Right, you want to find this. You know these guys, so this is the ultrasound to tracker. We've calibrated this in the lab going in. And then this is the tracker system. We know what that is, is that's produced by the vendor. Uh, so what you want to do is try to find this. If you could find that, then you could indeed do what David said, would like to do. Just, he'd like to just walk in, patient's there, put his scan head down, be registered. That's, it. that's, what, that's his approach. So that, that, is, that is a challenging problem. Um, so we developed a two-step approach, sort of following some other work in the literature, really, uh, where we made a binary. Uh, one of the challenges is how do you get it started? David didn't want us to, we, he didn't want to use, the, again, the fiducial registration to get started. He just wanted to sit here, I don't know where it is. I'm not even telling you what part of the uh, brain I'm going to be operating on. Could we, what would be the minimum information that we would have to provide? So this binary registration helped us get there, and I'll show you how we did that. It's a sort of simplified down sample the information, if you want to think of it that way, to sort of get the ultrasound and MR uh, more or less in the right way and then use the grayscale information, which is richer, uh, to uh, refine that registration. What we found is that we used that from the start. It was too much information, and, and we couldn't get reliable convergence. Whoops. And then to re-register the grayscales. So here's the picture. Uh, just, show, just walk you through this. So uh, the original MR, there's segmentation. I think we use a level set uh, technique uh, commonly. Uh, we produce this gradient image, and then we dilate that, in part to make it look like what we see in an, M, uh, in an ultrasound boundary similarly. So here's the uh, ultrasound um, sequence. Similarly, some pre-processing of that data, ending up with this um, um, image, binary image. Again, this is three-dimensional. I'm just showing you the 2D data as a presentation, so it's all fully three-dimensional that we want to try to register. So how did we think about this? Well, we have the brain surface, and it's discretized as a wireframe, if you will, and then we randomly sampled 50 points on that wireframe, and Song Bai Jai did a lot of this work, and he can comment if there's detailed questions. I think he fooled only nominally with a number of sample positions, and it's not a big factor. Uh, once we had those positions, each of those positions, we then perturbed the rotational characteristics of the scan head, and then try to register all of those and take the best out of that group. So it turned out there were 500 uh, random initial positions that are, and we do this on a, on a multi-processor. I think the whole thing takes about 15 minutes, so it's probably a little slowish, although uh, it might not be too bad, uh, and we probably can get it down by taking a number of um, compromises, if you will. So here's the binary registration. Uh, in this setting, so it's this with this, um, and so it does actually pretty well. So one of the nice things about that 3D scan is we, and we never saw when we had swept 2D, was we really do see the, what we call the parenchymal surface contralateral to the scan head position. That comes in very nicely, and that's kind of a fixed structure, and, we, and I'll show you later how we use that as a fixed structure uh, that we can rely on. So it's really aided our ability to do this. What about the capture range? You know, if I, if I, once I've got that registration, if I perturb off that both in distance and angle, what do I get? And we did this on 10 patients, you know, they're all retrospective, of course. Uh, and it wasn't bad. So almost uh, two and a half uh, centimeters and, and a decent angle. So it was pretty robust. 
So then, um, what about the grayscale, bringing in the grayscale information to try to refine that? What, what did we do? And we've done it two ways uh, with the correlation ratio from uh, Roche et al. and uh, then maximizing MI. Uh, I'm going to show you the correlation ratio stuff. We haven't compared it too closely. When we started out, we were using ITK, and this uh, mutual information had the um, multi-threaded capabilities, so it was much faster than this. We built this algorithm, I think, ourselves, and uh, now have it multi-threaded and could do a little bit better head-to-head uh, -head comparison. I think uh, at a top level, they're about the same. That's my gut feeling. I mean, you may be a fan of one versus another and may be able to argue one versus another. As a person not vested too heavily in either, we just want a tool that works. I, in my, my assessment, they're, they're, about, they're very similar. So here's that uh, then sort of running the grayscales through there and getting the correction uh, here. Uh, I think this arrow, maybe I've got it on the next slide, sort of looking at the faults here and how much better it got. So here's an example from one of the patients. So the binary registration. Uh, okay, put back on to the, maybe into the uh, green is the uh, ultrasound and red is the MR. Uh, after the refinement, and then here's the fiducial registration. So you can see these arrows sort of pointing out little places where things have gotten were improved actually over the fiducial registration. Again, I think largely because I'm dealing with volume information as opposed to only surface uh, fiducials. Here's even a more uh, illustrative case or a more dramatic case perhaps between fiducial and this fiducial less registration, sort of following the sequence through. So look look at this on the uh, fiducial registration that really does does get cleaned up. And the difference from binary, the binary is actually not bad. You do see some, some improvements of where some of these structures are showing up. Capture range, studied that. It's pretty big. And then uh, for accuracy, I think in the work that we're doing, we used both a target registration type concept, although there's no real known target. And here I'm just reporting the classic fiducial registration error. Uh, between the methods, so the binary registration correlation ratio, which sort of takes off from here, and then the original fiducial across the 10 patients. You know, you can look at the various ones, but here's the bottom line here. So uh, we do improve the binary with the uh, grayscale augmentation, and uh, that ends up being better than the fiducial, at least across, on average, across these patients. So it was very promising. Now, in practice, would we use this. I don't know. I mean, I think there's some risk. What if it fails? And the, you've got to open the dura to, to make, get the ultrasound acquisition. So I think there's some risk. We'd have to sort of show it's a lot more robust than we have so far. But it's, a, it's an interesting idea and it seems to work. Okay. What about uh, displacement mapping? Let's talk about that for um, a bit here. This is counting down in... Yes. Okay. So we started out, uh, so the idea would be to use scans taken during the surgery and relate them to one another uh, to try to extract displacement information. From our point of view, we wanted to put that into the modeling process that we had in order to get what we call this full volume estimation and project that back on the MR. So that's where we were going. So what I'm going to show you here and what we've evolved to is because of the three-dimensional information that's well sampled reliably sampled, not uniformly sampled, but reliably sampled, predictably sampled, we found now we can go from ultrasound to ultrasound to ultrasound. Originally, we tried to go ultrasound back to MR every time because the ultrasound was less feature rich, so there were less things to see in it, and uh, it was less well sampled. So the, ultra, the, the MR was volumetric, and we would always find, always could sample relate an, M, uh, uh, an ultrasound acquisition at any point in time back to the original MR. There was always correspondence there. But we had far few features. And we weren't that, we, we did some things, it was okay. It worked all right, but not nearly as good as this. This is actually pretty neat. And I think it's because of the 3D information. Again, it's predictable, it's reliable, uh, and you can use it then to get this displacement map and follow it over time. So I won't show you any of our work to try to register ultrasound temporally back to MR and then extract, you know, then those differences in those two, registration between an ultrasound here back to MR and an ultrasound later back to MR, that difference we were trying to use as a displacement field. Again, it was really limited and didn't work. It worked okay, but not as well as this. 
So the idea is successfully acquired uh, 3D USs. And again, we're talking about true 3D. I know people will say, oh, what a scan. So you, if you read the literature, a lot of people view that as, we call that, that, that technically reconstructed uh, 3D. I don't think it's nearly as good because you're relying, again, on that hand sweeping. That, at least in our, in our hands, at least in our hands, I should say, and in our experience in trying to analyze that data quantitatively, this, this we found to be way better. Uh, it's in a common world coordinate system. They are. So we can register a later scan to an earlier one. And we did this, again, sort of first with a rigid transformation to try to take out the tracking error component, uh, re-register then to get this volume acquisition, a volume displacement map, and, uh, you know, we can keep track over time, so you can register the first to the second to the first and the third, third to the second and so forth. So uh, to do this, of course, we need 3D, uh, we need uh, intra-modality uh, registration methods, and I'm going to talk about that for just a minute here briefly. So now the paradigm looks like this. Here's our equation. You know, we know these things. These are all known. So we can, because of the ultrasound acquisitions are tracked, so we can compute this. We can re-register it to get rid of error and then relate the differences uh, in features to a displacement. So, so that's sort of the overall strategy. And here's just a quick picture of this. Uh, and we're using mutual information here for re-registration. So this is before. So green is, uh, maybe red is original, and then green is later. So if it's yellow, then those colors are blending out, and um, you see it, uh, th that's perfectly aligned. So you can see that we've definitely improved things um, after the re-registration. And it's got a pretty large capture range when we use this and do this in full 3D with a full volume acquisition. So these are plots, again, I make that registration, then I perturb off that by some distance and some rotation and make these, this is over five patients, I think, this data set here. Uh, sort of displaying that information and using the measure of if 95% of the uh, registrations are successful. Uh, as a criteria for defining a capture range, which is, which is used in the literature, I think, in some of these other papers. You know, it's pretty big now in translation, quite, quite some distance uh, and an angle. And so I don't show this data. Here's, where, here's what I was referring to when we tried to relate 2D ultrasound to PMR in terms of its capture range for displacement mapping. You know, it's pretty, pretty limited. So uh, if you're very far off, you can't, can't recover. Uh, and this... Uh, with this data here with true 3D ultrasound, it's, it's, it's similar to the track stuff in, in the best work that we saw in the literature um, sort of shown here. So this kind of distance relative to that, this, the, these sort of degrees. So we feel, feel it's a good, uh, good quality. <clears throat> so I, this may be a little repetitive. So here's, the, again, here's the over. Well, I guess, so that's ultrasound to ultrasound registration. And now how do we use it for displacement mapping? I sort of alluded to this. So we first make a rigid registration sort of before and then dural opening and then after dural opening and then subsequently during the procedure what we use is information contralateral to where the scan head is, this uh, parenchymal surface on the bottom of the image because it's pretty stable as a way of getting out the tracking error. So we first make that registration and then we do a re-registration of that. Uh, I think we're using a, uh, if I remember right, a B spline is uh, the not producing a nonlinear characteristic off of an, off an MI uh, similarity measure. So here's a picture of it, and this uh, actually Song Bai has done lines here of this work, and he reported it here to you last year. Those of you might have seen it. So here's the information. So we take this mask uh, to define what we're going to use as stationary information to to get again to try to reduce the tracking error make that rigid registration, and then you can still see the misalignment here uh, that's that registration, the nonlinear registration, or the um, non-rigid registration uh, to produce these um, displacement maps. So um, it's volumetric. It's pretty robust. 
we feel it's pretty accurate. I'm not showing you real uh, validation data. We've done, done a certain amount of that. Um, there's always some assumptions um, when you're in human data. And it's pretty efficient, actually. You can do this. In, our goal in all this stuff was doing it in less than five minutes because we want to produce these updates, ultimately, the neurosurgeon within a handful of minutes. So it can be done pretty quickly. Uh, and the nice thing, uh, you don't have to segment anything, and the features aren't limited to tumors. So whatever's in the ultrasound, and again, another argument, again, for the 3D acquisition, it's, we find it to be more feature-rich than the swept version. And here, here's a nice illustration. Let me walk through this uh, for a minute. It sort of illustrates kind of nicely. So here, so red is uh, one acquisition, and green is an acquisition later. So this is the misalignment on the opposite side. The scan head sitting up here. So this, we feel, is largely error due to uh, tracking. Um, tumor in this image is sitting up over here. So this is before any registration. So then when we do that rigid registration, we can align this base. And you can still see, so green and red are still different. So there's still misregistration, if you will, that we, do, we assign to then deformation. And uh, then that is re-registered. And then that difference, you know, that, that difference or this difference here is projected based on that re-registration into a displacement map, a full volume displacement map that we can then use in our modeling strategies to try to estimate uh, the updated MR, as we, like, as we like to call it. So coming back full circle, and um, still got a few more minutes, and I'll, um, I've got a few more slides here, so that'll work out well. Let's come back full, full circle to this idea that I mentioned in the beginning, ultrasound as being a part of an overall system with that idea now that we can map these uh, displacements with the ultrasound work. Uh, so we've been talking about that. I'm going to briefly mention, well, I'm not going to go into it, we also use stereo vision, so that is a way of observing the surgical cavity as it changes shape and uh, things move. So that's another feed into the system, and we've been pretty successful in using that. Uh, so it's tracked, and we're uh, working with Medtronic, and we use their stealth station, and this is the Zeiss Pentero with the tracking thing. We mount, uh, I was looking for this song, but I don't, uh, I don't know if the cameras mount up top here. I can't quite, I don't see the cameras, but I, I know they're on the top, the stereo vision through, through a couple of the optical ports of the Pentero. Um, here's an example of what you can get. So here's a sequence of, again, just in this projected it's all three-dimensional in this projected cross-section, what the cross-section of this stereo surface would be. So zero is that before dural opening matches up pretty well. Then after dural opening, you can see some bulging over here, which is not uh, uncommon. Uh, or here, maybe that's here, really did bulge. Then after what's two, after partial resection, resection must be happening perhaps over here. And then three, after complete resection, you can so you can follow the surgical surface, if you will, as information. Uh, so a little shameless advertising. Um, Song Bai has a uh, very inter not not related exactly to that, but in using the stereo vision information uh, in a poster, um, looking at uh, um, strain on the surface, etc. And then Xiao Yao is giving a talk on Tuesday about uh, some of the use of stereo vision data. So here's an example just to illustrate bringing some of this all the way home. This is a case, a surgical case, uh, pre looking at the pre-op data, different slices, um, different views, uh, th three orthogonal or three classic views, uh, axial, coronal, and sagittal, I guess. Uh, this, these are pre-ops, so the um, red line is this uh, stereo surface that's recovered by the stereo vision system. The, the microscope is tracked, so this X is the focal point of the operating microscope sitting on that. So you can see, you know, things have definitely changed relative to the pre-op. If you take that data, and in this, this example, this is that same patient uh, later in the case where we've also taken an ultrasound acquisition, gotten that displacement information, and then updated. So here's the stereo surface again. You can see uh, we don't have perfect updating because, again, we use that as estimates. 
That is, we don't, per we don't enforce exactly, in this particular uh, estimation, we're not enforcing exactly the stereo surface, but using it for guidance, but it matches up pretty well. I think we, in the, in the mis misfit measure that we use uh, to assess, uh, that, you know, that, that our optimization is building on, uh, sort of reduced down, I, I forget what it was originally, uh, to a millimeter and a half, which isn't too bad when you, particularly when you, if you go back and you look at this, you know, so there's, there's pretty, pretty big differences uh, relative to the pre-op. Um, we've done some interesting things with retraction, and um, this is a, an example, again, using those data streams with the modeling. So we're, we're doing some fluorescence imaging here. And so when you see pink, it's the tumor for, uh, uh, emitting portoporphin 9 after a patient has drunk an ALA. Um, here is the pre-surgical uh, segmentation of the tumor volume projected into the uh, heads-up display. Here's the focus of the optical uh, axis of the operating microscope. So this is fluorescing, so really there's tumor here. And if you look at the pre-op MR, this X is outside of tumor, as, as you would expect given that. But after the updating with the retraction, we can follow those retractors with the stereo vision, how they've moved and how far they've gone. You can see this X now is, is sitting on tumor. And while it's indirect evidence, I mean, we don't know exactly that, that this point, which is that point right there, you know, is exactly that point in tumor, but at least it's on tumor. So we've definitely made an improvement in the image updating. And we're doing things with, of course, uh, resection. And this is another example of using this information, projecting it, uh, capturing it during the surgery, using it in the model estimation, and then projecting the model estimation back onto the MR to produce these updates. And you can see that these things are, uh, all, this is the guiding information. So in the update, it, it does return back, although we don't enforce it exactly. We have, you know, it's a, it's a model matching or estimation process, and so it all looks pretty consistent. So, I'm faster than I usually am. Here's my last slide. One of the things um, that we are fortunate to be working actually with Medtronic now, we have one of these academic industrial partnerships that the NCI has been fond of, and what we'd like to do is actually build the two-way connectivity with the stealth station so that we could produce these image updates and feed them into the guidance uh, visualization that the surgeon is used to looking at. So we want this bi-directional stealth link. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the Medtronic platform, the stealth link allows you to pull stuff out of um, the stealth station but not put anything back. So we sort of envision this uh, s control system, if you will, probably going to have an operator uh, because things aren't that automated that would you know, acquire these data streams at given times at the, at the uh, request of the surgeon. You know, there's a fair amount of computational processing. All the computational processing are remarkably cheap. I and mean, we just bought a, I don't know, a 32 processor, uh, I don't know, 64 gig RAM for about 6,000 bucks. I mean, it's amazing what you can now get. Um, so, you know, this data is going to come in, ship it off, or have it right next to you. Um, and then feed this back in uh, into the stealth so the surgeon can look at it. We've got some trials designed to sort of see if that's going to produce any kind of a surgical outcome. We're just only looking at surgical outcomes, uh, completeness or resection types of measure based on post-op MR assessments um, that we hope we're going to get to over the next handful of years. So we're excited to work with uh, Medtronic on this project and see it's been a long time in coming. We've been developing a lot of these ideas again since uh, you know, the, the mid-90s, back to the mega days, yeah. Um, and this, hopefully, will get this out now on a platform that maybe others could try it as well. So with that said, um, thank you very much, and um, be happy to try to answer any questions. I appreciate your attention. <laughs>